Stinking Success. This is episode 114. Welcome to the Kiwi Mana Day. This week we are talking about new weed killer causes a stink, criminal elements and New Zealand beekeeper found not guilty. This is episode 114 of our beekeeping podcast. Yes, welcome to the Kiwi Mana Buzz. I'm Gary, and that's Margaret. And we are beekeepers from the hills of the Waitaki Ranges on the wild west coast of New West Auckland, New Zealand. And our podcast is about beekeeping, what we've been up to, and with a bit of gardening and politics about environmental issues affecting beekeeping and bees. And we've also been known to go off on what? In a tangent or two about other issues. Absolutely, and it's spring, spring Yay! in New Zealand. Yeah, we've just come out of our first month. And the show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash 114. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. We know life is busy for you and appreciate that you've taken time to join us today. So that is awesomeness. What, Gary? Banana! Indeed. Awesomeness <laughs> bananas. Yeah, cheers, guys. Anyway, let's get to on with the show because we... <laughs> We, have to. we do have to get on with the show. So let's move on, Gary. There's Absolutely. And there's some sad news from the Kiwi Mana Buzz. Indeed there is. <sighs> my uh, my little car called the mm. Beehive was probably killed in a rear end accident last week. I'm okay, but the car's probably a write-off, which means it's been uh, too expensive to repair. So we're, we're waiting to hear from the insurance company about that. We will tell you more. And we've also updated the top beekeeping podcasts. And the show called Hive Talk with David and John is back after a three-year break. Wow, good on you for getting back to it. If you want to check out other beekeeping podcasts, look at kiwi.bz slash top pods. Excellent. So it's always good to have a listen around, guys. And uh, yeah, awesomeness. Now, what's happening? Well, we've also released a uh, blog post about how to install the app, and we had an election, didn't we? A political election. Yes. and This is the tangent of the show. Is it the tangent? Well, congratulations to New Zealand, the New Zealand First Party, the only party that's guaranteed to be in power. <laughs> yes, it's been a very interesting time, and, and so everything's hanging in the balance at the moment, and uh, it looks like New Zealand First have that balance of power, so... We don't know where New Zealand's going, but our ship is just sailing along now without a captain. (laughs) Yes, I know. Well, the thing in New Zealand, we have a thing called MMP. So the two main parties have got half the votes, haven't they? So it's uh, it's, it's it's dependent on the smaller parties, like the Green Party and New Zealand First, to go into coalition with another with a bigger party. Well, it's still to be determined because there might be some backdoor things. uh, Is it backdoor? Or back room things going on to uh, see where that all ends up, guys. So watch the space. We'll let you know. Yeah, hopefully by the next show we'll know who's the who is going to be in Parliament. Yeah, but I'm not holding my breath about it. I'm just getting on with it. Get on with it, exactly. And what did we get on with, Gary? Well, we had a knees up at the first Bees Knees Club meeting, hey, the first real life meeting. Yeah, we actually have got that Facebook group and it's doing really well and everyone's contributing, so it's awesome. And we actually uh, got together and had a nice cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. it was nice, eh? It, yeah, was, it, was, a, good, it was a small, small elite group. Yeah, well, I don't know about elite, but it was a small and perfectly formed cluster, as I said in the newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> and what have you been up to then? I, I saw some students walking around the property the other day. Oh, yes. Well, what happened was is we ran a course towards, I think it was around May, and we couldn't get the APRI visit in. So um, we finally got the students into the APRI for a practical day, and it only took four months to get it finally done. So it is completed now, and I'd like to thank uh, Simone, Daryl, and Dave for the understanding. And we did end up going to the education APRI which is awesome, and the bees there are just doing so well. And the reason for that is because Kiwi Mana HQ is still an absolute mud fest at this point. So we just showed the students the different types of hive styles, like the top bar, the long bench hive, and the lifestyler, the seven-frame box, and some nucleus boxes. So they can see just the different ways bees can be kept. 
And then showing them how to manage a hive a bit easier with the hive stand. So that's awesome. And I have a bit of news, Gary. What's that? You know how we... Oh, I really should wait. Okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) We'll wait then. Okay. The Education Apri girls are really thriving. Nectar is flowing over that side of the hill. But the most wonderful sight when looking at the wax comb is seeing how yellow their wax is. It's so much more yellow than the other colony where they're they're drawing wax and it's quite white. So, yeah, that was a really interesting thing from that area. So something definitely different over there. Must be a different kind of nectar, eh, for different hives. Yeah, interesting. And I was working over the weekend with another customer doing the Decker checks, and I'll talk about that too, I think. Anyway, um, in one frame we saw the nectar, like right in the very middle, there was really, really, really dark, dark nectar, like a real brownie colour. And then on the outside of it was very clear nectar, So it's very interesting, and I'm wondering if perhaps, because he had sugar syrup feeders in there, whether they had collected nectar, and then they started drinking the syrup and started putting that in there. So that was a very interesting thing to see. Yeah, it might be. You should put food colouring in it to see if it makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that was interesting. And um, you're going back to the Education Apri. They have a few flying drones, but there are more drones coming because there's a lot of cells in there. And we opened up some cells of the drones and really shockingly, they had about four mites in one cell. So treatments are ongoing with them. So it looks like this is the norm these days. So don't get caught out, guys, especially if you are looking after your hives in an organic way. Um, You need to keep an eye on those monitoring and those figures of the monitoring and then treat if you need to, especially if you are doing organic methods. What are you monitoring? Might fall. Okay, that's good. Okay, very good. Okay, and so the next job is to see all those drones hatch and then give them a few days to mature and then I think the area will be ready and I will preempt a split. So hopefully no queen cells are in there. I'll be going tomorrow and see what's going on in there and prepare. Yes, because we've heard some customers' hives have already split by themselves, haven't they? Yeah, I think um, it's a space management thing because the people that I've been working with, we've been, there's, the areas are so different. So we're, um, we're in central Auckland. They're already raising queen cells and proper full mature ones. Then in just, uh, but going a bit more west, there's queen cells there being drawn. In one customer's hive, they had three on one frame and then one on another. So we split those colonies and uh, we're trying to keep the old queen, but I think she might have left because I couldn't see any brand new eggs. So I think she has done a split. And that was the one that they thought was going to die from um, the varroa load, but they've actually come through and are absolutely pumping. Then there's the west side where we are, and that colony had... One colony that was doing really well, lots of population, but hardly any, um, just a few bits of drone. And then the other one, which is next door to it, that one had three cells in it, but they were more emergency cells. So that hive obviously had some struggles. It's building up now, but I think that one will be a bit slower than the really populated one. So they're obviously thinking there's something not quite right. Yeah, yeah, she must be failing or something, eh? Yeah, I, I don't know, eh? I just, I, I think sometimes the colonies that I've um, seen is that where there's a lot of damp inside them, they seem to struggle more. So it's really important to keep your hives as dry as possible, guys. Yes, indeed. Oh, no, amazingly, I thought that the, the girls in the lifestyle hive had passed, but. I thought I'd better go in and check. And they're still hanging in there, guys. And I'm just so surprised about it and very excited. And it was just the weekend gone and there was Queenie. 
and she had laying and had eggs and larvae. And um, what happened was is I added a frame of bees from the education apiary and it seems to have really helped and given them a boost. So she's laying well and I'll just see what she's like in a couple of weeks. Just a warning with that, guys. I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't confident that the education apiary hive was healthy. So it's it's better to take bees from a healthy hive that you know is disease-free rather than put the weak hive into a very strong hive. So that's the difference between understanding how you could cause your colony to get sick. So, yeah, because um, you've always yeah. got to check for fowl brood, don't you, before moving any equipment between hives. Yeah, and um, those kind of disease risks and health of your hive – you are taking from needs to be considered as well so you know you don't want to collapse a really strong colony by taking away all their you know their new girls coming through because you know the older ones may pass and then they've got no one there so those things need to be considered before making these kind of moves anyway the fact that they're still there I should have had more faith Yes, more faith indeed It just proves to me that honeybees are awesome and actually do know what they have to do Hey. <laughs> yeah, they're better at being bees than we are. Oh, absolutely. And um, yeah, the lawns are now needing a real mow. But anyway, I'll just get a cup of tea, sit on the deck and contemplate as I watch the forget-me-nots, dandelions, the clematis, vine and daisies popping their heads <laughs> and flowers above the blades of grass. No, you must mow the lawns. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can because it's so wet. But anyway, we'll move on to that as we go along, guys. Okay, let's move on to blog recap. This is where we review the top three blog posts of last month. And number one, controversial this one. The top ten plants for bees during the winter months. Holy camoly. This yes. was. Been read over 2,000 times and lots of comments. A lot yeah. of people complaining about different things and disagreeing with things. And no, it's interesting. We've, we've, cha- we've put a challenge out there because this, this is probably for the American parts of America. If you want to do a, a similar post like this for your area, just get in touch and you can do your own one for your area. Yes, indeed. And is Emily really who she says she is? <laughs> Yes, yes, that is a discussion we shall have later. Absolutely, and and I think that the reality is, is that a lot of the plants are hybrids or are of the same family of some of the ones we have here in New Zealand or in in Australia, so um, and maybe the UK. So, guys, if you've got your ideas of what should be getting planted, just pop us an email and we'll. We'll add your feedback, so every bit of feedback's awesome. Absolutely, and we're going to be changing the way the guest posts are done in the future to um, make it, you know, we're trying to get some really good content out there for you guys, so if you guys want to be involved in that, please get in touch. And just know, always working, guys. You may not always hear from us, but we are busy working, answering emails, taking phone calls, giving some advice, doing our beekeeping inspections and services and making stuff. So we're always busy. But if you email us, we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. (laughs) Yeah, usual time is about 90 days. (laughs) (laughs) We're getting through some of the older ones. But we're getting better and we're trying to get it down to 14 days. But we need need to hire minions, but we haven't got enough money to hire the minions. (laughs) It's all good, guys, so um, keep all that stuff coming in because we love reading about all your views and opinions, so it's all good. Yes, and the second season was our last podcast, Bee Breeding Season Starts New Zealand, so that was pretty successful. And the third popular one was Bad Beekeeping with Ron Mitchka from Canada. That was a great podcast, wasn't it? Yeah, and don't forget, guys, that these blog posts are actually – the result of you reading them. So we only talk about the ones that you have actually been clicking on and getting into. So thanks for that. And, um, yeah, we're glad you enjoyed them and keep it coming, eh? Absolutely. That's for you, Gary. (laughs) I'm trying. (laughs) Yeah, stop having a car accident. 
Well, I wasn't. I, I didn't intend to. Someone ran into me. Remember? Oh, anyway, I do remember. I've been reminded of that. Oh, it's traumatic. It's, it's very traumatic. <laughs> Beekeeping news. News you can't lose. No, and their views from all of yous. And lucky this month to get support from our supporters, Graham and Amanda. Yeah, so this means that we can bring these things to you, these articles, we can do our blog posts and all this kind of thing. And so th- so much thanks to you guys for supporting us. And the first post, incredibly stupid things a beekeeper can do. This must be a long post, eh? I think so. And this is a great post by Rusty from the Honey Bee Suite. And the story that most beekeepers can relate to about harvesting honey. And I love the quote, words I didn't know I knew taint the air. She should be a writer, eh? Well, she's a writer. She is a writer. She's a published writer. (laughs) Should be a novelist. Rusty, you should be a novelist. And what's the quote from that article? Says... The worst beekeeping mistakes come from putting off what you should have done yesterday. Somehow, problems inside a beehive don't get better by themselves. I keep thinking they will, but they don't. This sounds like procrastination, not the last show. Yes, don't put off today what you can do next week or tomorrow. What's that saying? Don't put off today what you can do put off tomorrow or something don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. It was a quote in last month's podcast. <laughs> so don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Yeah, and this is a great post about her adventures of harvesting honey and the mistakes that often happen. And I can relate to most of those. With You know, you get you drop honey, you get robbing all over the place. It's, it's quite interesting. And we had some feedback from Tracy Robinson. She's part of the Bees Knees Club, isn't she? That's right, girl. That's right. Thanks, Tracy. And she says, oh, my God, that is so funny. I don't feel quite so daft for some of the things I've done after reading that. <laughs> Smiley face. Absolutely. And Noel McFarlane, what does he say? He says the amazing thing is she remembered it all. Well. So he, true. She's a blogger. Yeah, and you can't learn, you know, you you can't learn anything if you don't make mistakes, but some of them can be a bit costly, and in my view, sometimes it's the bees that pay for it, so preparedness is very good. Well, this following following story, is it a mistake, and who will pay for it? Hey, it's... but before we go there, mm-hmm. remember that saying from that last podcast we did, that it's amazing how a sting can focus the mind? We haven't done that yet. It's coming up. No. Well, coming up now, guys. (laughs) (laughs) It's at the end. We're going to talk about that at the end. Oh, okay. We'll cut that bit out. Anyway, speaking of... Why do you want to cut that out? Because we're talking about it at the end. Speaking of mistakes, this next one. Do you think it's the bees bees going to suffer or or will the beekeeper? This story is called, Is the New Langstroth Hive Made Out of Concrete? This is an idea from South Africa that may solve the high theft issues around the world. Concrete beehives. Are these a great idea or just a pain in the back? And what's the quote from the article? (laughs) My back just went crack just reading that. Anyway, okay, so what do they say? They say beekeepers in Johannesburg, South Africa, are facing the same declining bee populations that are being seen in the United States. Not only are South African honeybees affected by the usual diseases and pesticides, they are also threatened by fires, honey badgers, and even vandals and thieves. Oh, no. So I guess their idea is that uh, make them out of concrete. (laughs) Yeah. So they've got Langstroth boxes, and the guy's, I think he's giving away the uh, moles for free. (laughs) And so you can make your own Langstroth boxes out of concrete. Mm. What do you think? I think these would be uh, very uninsulating and very heavy, and you need a forklift, wouldn't you? Yeah, I just all these all these ideas of being a nuisance or being difficult come to my mind. Like the bees, maybe if they get damp, I don't know. It just it, it just doesn't sound right. I can understand what they're thinking, but geez, Louise. Yeah, I know. And uh, what's the first comment? The first comment that comes through from P- Pualo. 
Jamid Silva, he says it's a terrible idea. Wood hides are already too heavy, so concrete ones must be really bad for people to lift unless you also buy a truck with a crane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, also have my doubts about it having better insulation than wood, but there are not enough details on the specifications to compare with regular wood hives. Another issue is durability. Drop one of those on the ground and it will break easily. Do the same with wood ones and no damage is done. Okay, so to finish his comment, he says, Also have to say that such photo is the perfect example of bad beekeeping. If there's one wildfire on the area, you will lose the hive. Concrete won't protect the bees from extreme temperatures and the wax will melt and catch fire. Mm. Yes, I think he's referring to the photo. It's got it's got the concrete hive in the middle of like tall grass. Yes, I think there's a valid point in there. It's almost like putting them in a pizza oven. Mm, exactly, or a concrete oven. Indeed. And so, George Hart, what does he say? Georgie Happy, he says, just what I was going to ask, how do the bees like living in concrete walls? As Anastasia from the Ringing Cedars of Russia books recommends we create a hive home similar to one that they would naturally create. Oh, okay. I've never read those. No, me neither. Paul Shulton says, best get the location right first time round them. <laughs> yeah, because you can't move it. Unless you put it on wheels. Maybe put it on wheels. Mm, I don't know. And, well, then the thieves will be happy because then oh, they can just the steal that. <laughs> Dave is, Pepper, what yeah. does he say? He says, how do you check the lower boxes and harvest honey with a front-end loader? <laughs> yeah, I reckon. And Debbie Jacko, we saw her the other week, didn't we, at the Yes, bee, we bee did. Club. She's very busy there. And very busy. Uh, she says, ACC are going to love these sorts of claims. Now, yeah. if you don't know, guys, ACC is the Accident Compensation Corporation we have here in New Zealand, and it helps you if you injure yourself through an accident and... Uh, yeah, getting a claim like this would be uh, a very interesting yeah. one to read, that's for sure. <laughs> Lifting concrete beehive, broke back. <laughs> and Rowan Crawford, he, he he puts a photo here of a, of a uh, strong man, and he's going, this is a photo of the average beekeeper using this hive. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that in the uh, show notes. And who's this, Margaret? What? That's you, isn't it? Yeah, that's me. And I said before that my back started aching just looking at it. Oh, exactly. <laughs> and Lyle Ken says, since concrete contains known carcinogens, I wonder how much silicon in the honey is acceptable until it's considered unsafe for human consumption. <laughs> that's so good. And thanks to um, Georgie, Paul, David, Debbie, Rowan, Margaret, and Lyle for getting back to us and sharing these wonderful um, comments. And, yeah, we, we feel the same as you guys. It's uh, it's a tough one to crack, that one. Do you like that? Did you, it's you it's an easy that? one to crack. Oh, easy one to crack, Gary. <laughs> oh, my goodness, a, man. Hit it with a hammer. <laughs> and this, this piece of news is brought to you thanks to Graeme and Amanda. And Graeme and his lovely other half, Amanda, are our patrons who have been supporting the Kiwi Mata Buzz since July 2015. Hope is all well with you guys. Yep. Cheers. And the next story, Taranaki creates technology to trace honey to hive. And this is Brett Maskell from Naki, New Zealand. That's the name of his company. Has come up with a great idea to allow consumers to track where their honey came from. And what's the quote say? Uh, the quote says, using radio frequency identification, RFID, a system that uses radio waves to read tags and cards for identification, the Hive Tech system allows for pot to hive traceability. Doesn't he mean hive to pot traceability? Anyway. No, no, it's pot to hive because every, every, I've just done some investigation on this, every hive has got like a, a, a number on the back and you can actually type that into on his website and you can see exactly which hive it came from. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that the honey comes from the hive, which is then put in the pot. I know, but he's reversing it because the consumer's only got the pot, haven't they? They don't have the hive. So they're okay. tracing the pot to the hive. Okay. Now, we're not going to call the pot 
or Kettle Black. No, we're not. <laughs> and Brett was recognised by the Roy Peterson Trophy for innovation on, in this invention at the recent Apiculture New Zealand conference in July. So good work there, Brett. Yeah, excellent, and um, look forward to more technology making life easier for us. Yeah, this is going to be a great invention, and uh, yeah, awesome. And uh, no feedback from anyone there, but it's yeah, okay. Yeah, I got some feedback. What's your feedback, My Margaret? feedback is, is that I hope we have a better honey season this year than we did last year. Yes, I totally agree. All right, so we're moving along, guys, and geez, Louise... This one's caused a real stink, hasn't it? A real it? pungent stink. Organic weed killer proves pungent success. The Christchurch City Council is using an organic weed killer to reduce the use of glyphosate slash Roundup products in their parks. This sounds like a great idea. Wouldn't it be great if the Auckland Council followed suit? What's the quote for this one? An organic weed killer being used by the Christchurch City Council is proving effective. As councils move to significantly reduce its use of the potentially dangerous weed killer glyphosate, council voted last year to limit the use of glyphosate, commonly sold as Roundup, and move to an organic alternative along with the hand-pulled and mechanically removed weeding systems. Yes, this stuff is great, isn't it? And to uh, help everyone see what it is, we actually did some investigation and we actually went and bought some, didn't we? Yes, what we did was Gary went out there and mixed some up and sprayed it in the morning. Within about four hours, all the weeds were dead, eh? Yeah, it's true, folks. Gary actually went out to the town's place where all the city folk are. Yeah. And he braved them to buy this so he could do this experiment just for you guys. And this... This weed killer is a combination of natural pine oils and fatty acids. It's non-residual, and it's non—it's a non-selective herbicide. So basically, it kills everything it touches. And it's called Kiwi Cares Organic Weed Free Rapid. And I've got a link there to the uh, article about it. And, yes, uh, it's and been, it's been BioGrow certified organic for use in organic gardening. Okay, well, it's definitely very rapido. And we'll put a photo in the show notes. And the show notes are at kiwi.bz slash 114. And we'll put a, show, a photo of the damage it did, or the, the great work it did, I guess. Yes, exactly. And this product is available at Mitre 10 and Placemakers. And please know, guys, that we bought that chemical ourselves. No one gave us any money for it. And we did the test ourselves because we want to... Our property is weed uh, killer free, and so we wanted to find something that could help us, and we did this test after reading that article. So articles like that from, you know, that tell us about these things, we give them a go, and uh, yeah, organic weed killer proves pungent success. I'm impressed with the Kiwi Care product. So Kiwi Care, if you're listening, you could sponsor the Kiwi Mana Buzz. That'd be awesome. So... <laughs> We're not going to buy a new car. Okay, feedback. First of all, we've got feedback from Carl War. He goes, good on you, Christchurch Council. Doing good is contagious. Keep it up. Yeah. Are you listening, Auckland Council? Probably not. Yes, they'll be listening. They'll be listening. Okay, and Graham says what, Gary? He says, Gary, any ideas what they use? And I've covered that, Graham, above. Yeah, we put that out we there. and out. That was a good, good question there, Graham, because... Uh, we do have an idea. And Rachel Dell says, and where do you get it from? Well, we answered that, that too. too. So awesome. And Phil Chandler, who is the barefoot beekeeper, isn't he? and he's from the UK. And what does he keep his hives he, in? Mainly top bars. Mainly top bars. But anyway, he says white vinegar works. I don't think it works as well as this, but Phil, I've tried, I've tried white vinegar in the past, and it yeah, seems to work a bit quicker. We did do it with, um, what was our, what else was with that vinegar one? There was uh, salt. Detergent and salt. Yeah, so that one did work, but it wasn't as, the results didn't hit in a couple of hours, seriously. And it seriously. didn't last long either, eh? No. So anyway, Jasley McSavney, she says, Nature's Way spray at Mitre 10 works well too, based on fatty acids, has clove oil in it, which you can smell, and that's organic. Thanks, oh, Jay Slee, for another, that. Another option. I didn't see, even tried that one, but that sounds good. Sounds like Jay Lee's tried it. 
Yeah, so Tried guys, it. um, give it a go. Be very careful when you spray it. Don't spray it onto something you love. Um, I always recommend taking a, a big board with you, you know, maybe some core flute or something, and just putting it on the side behind the plants you're spraying so it doesn't just overspray. So um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the instructions, as it's as it's National Animal Day, it's said in the instructions: do not spray on animals. So, geez, Louise, you'd think that who people would, who would, would do that yeah, anyway. anyway. <laughs> okay, well, this next one says: bees die in the cold after vandals open and kick hives. What's happening there, Gary? Well, Wellington's local flavour urban honeys, seen Lloyd, has had hives kicked over, exposing to the elements. Sounds like kids to me, but that doesn't make it a loss any any better, does it? No, and the article goes on to say, Twice this month, vandals have opened the hives in the Burhampur community garden, killing about 10,000 bees in one hive by exposing them to the cold. And it is cold here, isn't it, at the moment? Absolutely, and we have a, uh, a recording here from the stuff.co.nz website. Let's play that. This is Sina. So we've had two incidences this month with um, vandals knocking over the hives. Earlier this month, it was quite a bit colder, so the hive on the right-hand side here actually died out from chill. The second incidence was this Sunday, but as you can see, the hive on the left is still going strong. We would just ask that if anyone's, you know, curious about bees, please get in contact with us. We're happy to show you through the hive instead of having someone come through and and kick it over and obviously you know, risk losing the hive. The hives were placed here in partnership with the community orchard. Um, obviously, the fruit trees are going to need bees to pollinate them. So uh, we partnered with Bronwyn and the community orchard here to provide fruit for the community. It's a really beautiful park-like setting. We encourage people to come take a walk through. You're welcome to walk up and have a look at the bees. Just please don't get too close or, or mess with them. But um, you know, this is a, a community service. We're trying to make Bear and Poor a little bit brighter, a little bit better, and uh, it's just really unfortunate that a few people are giving us a bit of trouble. Yes. Yes, that's Indeed. true, Sina. And, you know, that's a good call out there. If you're interested in the bees, just get in touch with Sina. Don't kick the hives over. Yeah, no kickboxing. No. Get it? Maybe concrete hives would have been good there because they could have hurt their toe. No, kickboxing. Get it? Yeah, I do. <laughs> kickboxing. <laughs> that is comedy gold. Comedy gold coming to you straight from the Kiwi Mana Buzz, guys. Okay, so what feedback did we get regarding that one? Well, Gareth Bellamy says... Ace holes. <laughs> Assholes. And I said just blimmin' beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Yeah, flaming mongrels, really, aren't they? Oh, yeah, they are. I mean, do you? It, it's probably kids, but what a bunch of idiots. Yeah, I think so. You know, it just makes you wonder. They're probably a bit scared of them, so they're trying to be tough or something. And I don't know. Oh, crazy. Probably daring each other. Yeah. So sorry to hear about that, Cena. Yeah. And, and there's a mess- what's this message here? Well,. Okay, so do you think that you have received even one piece of information from our work that has helped you in your beekeeping? Do you think that that information was worth maybe a dollar a month? If you do, can you help us to help you by becoming a patron and donate a dollar a month? And that will make sure that you keep getting heaps of stuff coming to you guys. It's easy to do here, and Gary's put the link on there. Absolutely. It's kiwimana.bz slash banana. Okay, so one of the benefits, because, you know, when you, you give this sort of money, you're thinking, well, what are the benefits for being a, a patron? Well, you get early access to the shows, up to probably a week or sometimes two weeks before the, they get public released. You also get exclusive content. You get um, access to the special Kiwi Mana Buzz bonus show and you get bonus content from interviews stuff that we left on the cutting room floor and stuff and also you get a warm heart don't you you sleep better at night knowing you're helping us produce our show (laughs) excellent so from my warm heart to you guys we'd love it if you could become a patron and as if that wasn't awesome enough here's some more guys so new zealand beekeeper found not guilty of smuggling cocaine hidden in suitcase This is fantastic. 
Roy Arbin, who was accused of smuggling cocaine, has won his case and will be returning back to New Zealand. And from the article, it says, A 68-year-old New Zealand man has been found not guilty of smuggling more than two kilograms of cocaine into Perth. Yes, and we've got a message from Roy. This is on uh, stuff as well. well let's, let's play this message from Roy. Out of this world, really free. It's hard to realise that, that, that I'm free. So I've only been there 80 months. But imagine if you're there 10 years. It's a bit hard to realise. It's right, free, you know. See the sky and see the sun, see see see, see the stars. Yeah, you know, you can't see the stars in prison. There's too many lights. That's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, I think um, it, it does make it interesting that you know you these people have had these experiences that we can't relate to, and we just. We just hope that uh, Roy settles back into a normal life again. And, yeah, understanding that he probably will be getting back into his beekeeping. So good on you, Roy. Yeah, he's expressed he wants to get back into his beekeeping. So that's awesome. And the, th- the thing is, what, what happened with Roy was he got conned by some Nigerian scamsters and he got involved in that. And that's what happened. And they made him carry a bag and he didn't realise what was in it. So you've got to really be careful, guys, when someone offers you something too good to be true. It probably isn't, is it? Yeah, it wasn't good at all. Anyway, we get some feedback about that from Stephen. What does he say, Dal? Uh, Stephen Stewart says, rather expensive powder to use for varroa treatment or testing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's one of the approved products by the uh, the authority. No, and no. I I just said all in jest, Roy, if you're listening. Yeah, Roy was a treatment free beekeeper, so Stephen he would not be using cocaine for his varroa mites. And it's great to see he got off and he's heading home soon. I think he's in his back now, isn't he? So I think it, it's not that he got off; he got found not guilty. Got found not guilty. So that's awesome. So he's welcome back home, and yeah. Good on you, Roy, and all the best, eh? Absolutely. Okay, questions from you. That's right, you. You there listening. That's you can you. answer questions. Let's open the mailbox and see what who, if anyone wants to send a message to us. Oh, oh, I can see something in there. There's a message from someone. Who does it say? What does it say, Margaret? It says it's from Ian, and he says... Hi, Margaret. I hope all is well. I know that you're a big fan of oxalic acid. I have a brood box that's been regularly treated throughout winter with Apivar, I'm told. I haven't taken account yet, but was thinking of starting an acid course prior to taking a mite count after the first week. What are your thoughts? Apistan has been suggested also. I'm determined to declare war on them mites this year. Regards, Ian. Okay, well, this is this is a good question. Okay, and I have talked to some people who are commercial guys, and it, it's there's so many schools of thought that you need to wade through everybody's opinion. My opinion is is do one type of treatment, then when you finish that treatment, wait seven days. Do a mite check, whatever way you've done it, whether it's a sugar shake or a, um, using an inspection board or however you want to do it, and use the same method all the time so you've got a regular and proper way to see trends. When you're putting treatment in, you expect to see mite fall, okay? That is a given, and that's always going to happen through. So the best advice is to always do a mite count before you treat, get some trends, maybe do a couple of 24-hour um, treats or, uh, I mean, monitoring, and then do your treatment. Then when the treatment's finished, wait a week for the bees just to get back to normal and then do another monitor. Yeah, and compare the results, so absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, the the thing is, is that a lot of people don't even check inside the cells. So for New Zealanders and Kiwi beekeepers, we'll be getting a lot of drone brood and inside the drone brood will be where the varroas love to go because there's a, you know, the cells are a lot bigger. The drones live long, um, take longer to uh, gestate, as it were. And and by the time they're hatched, they're the ones that I saw in my education, April, and I've been treading through there, 
there was about four mites in one cell. So it's do a count before, do your treatments, you'll see lots of drop, then wait a week after you've finished, do another monitor, and then if you're organic, you can actually keep doing the treatment. It won't be a problem. And Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, my comment about Apistan, probably not really going to be uh, published. Uh, yeah, but absolutely. But whatever you use to decide to treat them with, it's, it's your, your choice there, Ian. But uh, just do a before and after test, as Margaret said. Yeah, and I think the reality is, is if you're using a whole lot of different treatments, you're not really going to find out what's going to be the best for your girls. And you're not actually, um, I think you're creating such a diverse range of products. I think it's better to stick with one or two treatments and I think those treatments should both be organic and using a chemical like Apistan is a synthetic product so it's it can create resistance in Varroa so you know that's it's a really a personal thing on what you want to do but my my view is that I'm just oxalic acid vaporizing every two weeks regardless. Okay, random review. This is where we read a, a review, and if you don't get in touch, we go and eat cake. And that was a case last month, and in the weekend we had some uh, toffee cake, didn't we, Dale? You love to have our cake and eat it too. And this is um, where you, as a customer, buys a product, and you go into our drawer for a certificate if you put in a product review. Yeah, a $30 gift voucher. You have to claim this prize before the 18th of October, or we go and eat cake. Let's draw this one. The winning number is... Seven. Number seven. Two seven. Okay, number seven is Pete Bonifat, and he bought some beekeeping gloves, and he says, inexpensive and be free with confidence. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Peter, for your feedback, and uh, get in touch with us and claim your prize. Okay, uh, feedback. Okay. First one is from Facebook. This is from Hayden Northcott from South Waikato. Hi, Gary and Margaret. I was wondering if anyone knew of a beekeeping club in South Waikato. I'm based in Tia Mutu, and the Waikato... Club meets too far away for me and too late in the day for it to work for me on a school night. Oh, that's no good. Thanks in advance. P.S. Loving the podcast. I enjoy your lightheartedness and humour. I listen to it while at work and it helps the day feel a little lighter. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thanks so much for those comments, Hayden. Yeah, we have uh, a lot of fun putting it together and, uh, yeah. yeah, we just... And it's awesome. Thanks, Yeah, Hayden. it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And the only one I know in the area, Hayden, is the Waikato domestic beekeeper, but that you're saying it's too far. I know this one at Rotorua, but that'd be probably too far as well, wouldn't it? Maybe just give the Waikato Domestic Beekeepers Association a call and they may know of someone in the area who's running a sort of a little small group or something. That might be the other thing you could try. Yeah, or well, the other thing is you could set up your own little group. You know, just uh, yeah, like the bee's knees, as, as as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Maybe set up a new, uh, yeah, new little group. Oh, very philosophical today, <laughs> Gary. It's late in the night. I'm philosophical. It is late in the night, and honestly, guys, to be honest, it's been a tough last week, hasn't it, Gary? Oh yes. Well, with car crashes and yeah, and financial you know, issues. It's uh, yeah. but we get we'll get through. Anyway, will, let's get the feedback will. from the Twitters. Tulip Tree Honey, he has some great advice this month. He said, love this podcast, get the app. Straight to the point. <laughs> yeah, that's thanks, great. Thanks, guys, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> awesome. And okay, the, what's next? The bonus show this week, we are talking about varroa mites having genetic holes in their armour and a handy chart for bee growth. The bonus show is for our amazing, fantastic, wonderful patrons. And as we talked before, you could be part of that. Our patrons who are um, include Amanda and Graham. Yes, absolutely. And the next show. Okay, well, just looking at what's next, Gary. 
Practical Beekeeping with Roger Patterson. This is an interview we do with Roger. He's a beekeeper from England. He's been beekeeping since 1963. Must be tired, eh? <laughs> and he's, sorry, old joke. He is from West Sussex in the United Kingdom. And he's the author of the book Beekeeping, a Practical Guide. And he's the practical beekeeper, concentrating on the basics and keeping things simple. Oh, I love simple. I love simple. And he's also the current president of the Whisperer Green Division of the West Sussex Beekeeping Association. And let's play a clip from that show. Margaret will like this one. But I would like to see them uh, discard their bee suits fairly quickly, and the uh, gloves especially, because there's absolutely nothing like getting stung for concentrating your mind. <laughs> Man, when I listened to the, this guy, I just loved it, and he's so true, you know? Uh, yeah, Nothing like a bee sting to concentrate the mind. Absolutely. And that show will be out on the 11th of October for our amazing patrons and for the 18th of October for the rest of the world. No pressure there, Gary, eh? <laughs> so you get shows earlier. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. And if you could do one thing this month, guys, can you please share this podcast with your friends, especially your beekeeping ones? You know? you know, just share it with anyone who wants to have a bit of fun and maybe learn something new. Absolutely. At the top of the page, which is kiwimana.bz slash 114, the share buttons, you can share it on the Twitters and the Facebooks and the, the Pinterests. Hey. Awesome. Awesome. So, so thanks this week for coming along, guys. We really appreciate you joining us, and we will talk to you in a couple of weeks with the Roger Patterson interview. Until then. See ya. Give me some sugar, little honey, natural bee. Hey guys, we just heard, uh, unfortunately, Tom Petty has passed away, so uh, just want to give a bit of a tribute there. He's uh, very talented guy and uh, we're going to miss his work a lot.